All right. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Unschooled Theology. I am Derek and with me is Evan. Hello to you, sir. Hey, how are you doing? Pretty good. Uh, let's let's get started here because we've got a little bit of a, a different, uh, I don't know, a different episode of, of I was going to say this show, but then I realized we've only done one episode. So it's, I mean, it's necessarily a different episode than the first By one. definition. Uh, different. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's something a little different in terms of uh, I think what people expect to to be discussed perhaps on a, a theology podcast, but uh, this is sort of a, a a little bit of a philosophical uh, idea, but it has to do with the levels on which uh, humans understand things and the levels on which truth exists. And now this is so I call this sort of three truths. And there are three ways of looking at the world, thinking of the world, making ontological claims, which are basically um, definitional claims. Uh, an ontology says when a thing is this, then it now fits into this category or definition. Um, I better, uh, I'll give an example of that when we get into this more, but yeah, uh, that's a good idea. So the three truths are uh, material, functional, and spiritual. And so these are, are three levels on which we can interpret the world, three levels on which something might be true. And so the material is, is frankly what uh, a lot of our society and, and life today is built around is this idea of defining something uh based on characteristics right what it what it is what it's made up of what it looks like what it smells like what it tastes like what its uh, composition is chemically or otherwise um that is a material approach to thinking it's it's material truth uh the second being the functional this is more um looking at things and processing things based on how they fit with everything else. <laughs> what is the role that it plays? What, is, uh, what does it do when it comes into interactions with other things? Uh, and so to distinguish between those two, this is where I think it's useful to give an example. Yeah, I think that will help. Um, one that I like to use a lot is the idea of imagine there's a hole in a dam right? Uh, if there's a hole in a dam, there's a variety of things you could use to fit into that dam and plug it together. Uh, you could use a sock, you could use a shirt, you could use a finger, you could use a putty, a rock, mud, whatever, right? Whatever you use to plug that dam in, it is a dam plug, if you will. But to, that is a functional definition. That is basically saying, hey, we're defining this based on the role that it fills. It plugs the dam. Those things, you know, the sock, the shoe, your finger, all these, these do not have a character to group them together, right? But because they can all fulfill that role, that function of plugging the dam, that is uh, a functional way of defining them, a functional way of bringing them all together. Can we take a pause right there just to talk about that? Um, one, one of the things that I found interesting, at least in, 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 in what I've been learning regards to psychology recently, is that I think our natural, our natural way of looking at the world is probably more functional than anything else, than the other two. And we haven't gotten to spiritual yet, I know. But we tend to look at things based on what they do and how we interact with them. Um, rather than first looking at their material, rather than first looking at their other things. We, we, we view things through the functional lens. Um, and I think, I, I think it's natural to say, well, but the modern world obsesses about materialism. I think that's true as well, but that's more because materialism has provided us so many opportunities for advancements. But our natural way of looking at things is not fundamentally simply material. It's functional, how, how we interact with that thing. Um, so when we, um, I'm trying to think of the illustration that I've seen for this. When we, when we see um, something that, that is you know, moving 
um, outside and people are driving around in it, we view that thing as the thing that is moving and taking people places, not as a, a mass of metal and rubber and um, plastic, which we would call a car. We look at it first as the function that it's going to do for us and how it's going to interact with us. Um, so I just I wanted to insert that there because I think that that's the way in which if you, if you take the very primal lens that we would look at the world, we tend to immediately view the functional. And then the material is is something that we have obsessed with, I think, over the course of the past roughly two to three hundred years, which has provided us immense advancements because of it. Yeah, I think there is definite benefit to considering the material. It's It's the kind of thing where I think we've gone a little bit too far with it Correct. Um, Correct. It, because we talk, you talk about the car, right? Um, yes. People would look at the function and say that, um, but they'll also look at a car that's, you know, doesn't even run well anymore and couldn't really do that thing. It would have to be restored to even be made to fill that function. We'll still call it a car. Right. Um, and I right. think, I think you're right. Our natural instinct is to look at it functionally and think through that way. However, I think there is a problem with, uh, with our education system and the fact that we are hammered home, the idea that the functional isn't quite valid, like you have to, it's the material, which is the thing that I guess is most verifiable, that is the most to defining something, but only way it is, well, because it's verifiable. <laughs> and so it's yeah. almost like, uh, we've built up the material just because it, it has a little more verifiability. It isn't as fluid, uh, perhaps, as a functional. I mean, uh, you could say if you really look at a car in this way and say it has to be taking people places, uh, it's like it's a car at some times and at other times it's not, you know, which kind of is true, right? It is, it is uh, fulfilling a function and taking you places, uh, you know, in this role of a car. And at other times, it's just a, it's a mass of metal and material sitting on the asphalt waiting to, you know, move again. Yeah. Let me extend maybe one more brief analogy, if you'll indulge me. Um, what, let's consider um, a, a child who is, um, either adopted or for some reason their primary caretaker is not a parent. Um, functionally, the child from a very young age is going to view whoever that caretaker is as, as parent. Functionally, even though biologically and one might say materially, that is not their parent. You know, it's not their mother, it's not their father. So functionally, we'll the, the child though will tend to view that person in the category of caretaker. Um, and so I think that that's, that's probably what I'm getting at is that we a lot of times view things through that impulsive perspective and then we can replace it with a material truth too or, or sometimes they can be almost different. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm getting at, I think, is, is that it's, it's an impulse to see things for how I interact with them, which I think is a functional way of viewing the world. Yeah, and you're definitely right. And, uh, and it's, it's strange, though, because you bring up that case of the, the child and the caretaker being the, the parent. And it's interesting to note yeah. that those people still, though, uh, not in every case, you know, but in many cases, they'll still have this desire to know who their parent was material, you know? Yes. There's this yes. material connection. And it's almost like while the functional is there, they can't just let that be enough. You know, they have to say, well, yeah, but I need to find the material parent as well. Because that is still, I think, by people seen as the real parent because it has that material connection. Um, so, this yeah, I, I do. Th I think we think functionally first, but we associate realness with the material um and i don't i don't know that 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 has its benefits but i think that has its drawbacks as well and that's what we'll get to here is i think you need to keep all of these truths uh in mind at once and you want to find the places in which they overlap i guess one last thing related to that then just a small extension and i don't i'm going out on a limb here but it comes to my mind that potentially we run into issues when there's a mismatch with truth then, because yes. one could say that the, that the biological parent not being the functional parent um, 
causes a mismatch and therefore causes dissonance within the mind of, of the child. Yes. Well, I think um, what we'll get to here is that I, what we're looking for, and I think this is one of the things we find in theology, is the cohesion of all three of these truths. That is correct, right, if you will. Yeah. Or it is capital T truth, right? And I, I think this, yeah. is, um, this is key with Jesus. Jesus is this cohesion of every truth all at once, right? Yeah, um, bringing together material functional and spiritual all at once and to that end i guess we should talk about the spiritual. talk about spiritual that's a good idea. yeah 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 so the spiritual to me um so looking at these other two we have what a thing is in the uh in the material we have what role it fills in the functional and then i think what naturally comes out of that then is okay what do we do with it what's the right way to use it you know, um, if you have a gun and functionally, you know, it does this materially, you know, it does this, then the question becomes of, okay, when is it right to fire the gun? You know, mm. uh, how should I be using this gun? That is where spiritual truth comes in. Spiritual is this question of what is the right way, the righteous way to use things. And that is uh, the third truth here. And, and like I said, we're sort of looking to bring all of those together. Mm -hmm. There is differing levels, actually, to which we uh, as humans experience these truths. There's different, um, what I would call, uh, solidity of mm -hmm. them. Um, there, there are different levels in which, at least in our ability to understand them, they are concrete and stay the same. Um, you know, the, the, the truth is the material of things does not change, but our ability to understand the material truth of something changes quite a bit. Uh, if you look at the idea of the elements, right? Originally, you have uh, with uh, uh, the early philosophers, you have the four elements, you have the earth, wind, fire. Uh, water. And now element means something completely different when we talk about that. We have this whole periodic table full of them. And, you know, they understood everything to be a combination of those four things. And we would look at that today and say, well, no, that's, that's ridiculous, right? Yeah. Um, so our, our ability to understand the material and the way we perceive the material truth, that's very fluid and that changes. Not that the material truth changes, but our ability to comprehend it changes. Mm -hmm. Functionally, I think it's a little more limited, right? We only see a small range of ways in which a thing can be used. And it's, it's, kind, of a, it's, it's kind of revolutionary when people come up with new ways to do things. It's innovation is that process, right? It's coming up with whole new ways to use these uh, resources around us. And that's a big deal because we only have so many ways we can see to use them. And the last one, the spiritual, this is the thing that I think we all understand is in fact uh, concrete and we, we see it a little more so um, that way and we experience it a little more so that way, right? The, the right way to use something is always the right way to use something. This is... Uh, you know, the Ten Commandments, you know, thou shalt not murder, right? Under all circumstances, you never murder. That is spiritually true. 100% of the time we experience it thusly, you know, uh, the idea of a one true God. Uh, same thing. It's, it's, um, it's solid. It's consistent. It's the least fluid of all of these things. Now, we may grow to develop different understandings of what is spiritually true, um, but I think as we do that, it, it, that comes out of, um, that experience of solidity, right? The more we recognize that God is not like us, he is consistent. He is, uh, persistently this one thing. He doesn't falter in that, that leads us to have a better understanding than of the spiritual truth. 
um, but it's born out of the fact that we see it as consistent. Whereas when we look at the material and functional, we're always looking for like the next layer of the material, right? What comes below the molecule? What comes below the atom? What comes below the, the electrons and the protons? We're always looking for that next like thing underneath. Uh, we're always looking for the next way we could functionally use something. Whereas spiritually, I think we look for an outgrowth of this central consistency, this central uh, axiom of it. Mm. Do you think the, uh, does the spiritual inform the functional? I think it informs uh, how we should use the functional that we discover, you know? Um, I think yeah. in a sense, it informs all three. Uh, I think the spiritual truths lead us to develop uh, philosophies, uh, ways of thinking, approaches to interpretation of the world around us that lead to how we develop uh, our understandings of the functional and then the material. Yeah. If that makes yeah. sense. That's fair. The, yeah, absolutely. I would think that, um, let me try and pass out an illustration for a second and then, um, because we have the gun exam analogy, which I think is a really good one for this interaction. Um, medicine jumps to mind as a really good um, view of this interaction. You know, uh, developments in material understanding have have helped a lot in creating new functions for for curing disease, for providing relief for certain mm -hmm. ailments, all sorts of things. There's, that's the the examples are are too numerous to name. Um, but I think the spiritual the spiritual question that underlies all that, or maybe informs all that, um, would be: It is a good thing to save people who are un who are unwell, or it is a good thing to heal the sick, um, which I think is fundamentally more of a spiritual question. Would that would that kind of would that illustration stack up and make sense? Yes, I think uh, I think the key is the material understanding gives us a better idea of just what uh an illness or an ailment is right we can yes. the more we materially understand it we we see it for what it is yeah then uh at a functional level we begin to see methods and means by which that can be healed or addressed yeah right the issue actually where i think uh you you get a spiritual question yeah. is the fact that we are still uh, imperfect in our means of healing these things, right? They come with trade-offs. And so, uh, you know, a, a chemo is an example of this, right? Um, you, are, you are killing the cancer by killing a lot. Killing a lot of it yourself, you know? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the spiritual question, if you will, is under which circumstances is it right to do that or not to take that risk right it's basically it's a risky proposition is what you're doing and that idea of weighing risk balancing risk uh that to me is a spiritual matter uh, spirit the spiritual uh truths are where we derive meaning from yeah right and so is it uh what would be the most meaningful approach here? You know, I mean, there are people who are so riddled with cancer and so obviously going to die that it becomes more meaningful for the remainder of their life to not put them through the pain of the chemo so that they might better enjoy the time that they have left, you know, yeah. where there are others for which it makes more sense to go through the chemo. And there are others who you know, uh, another means of addressing the cancer makes more sense because they have a strong enough immune system and are, are in a place where they they're have the potential for other treatments to work better, that uh, the chemo itself may, in fact, weaken them in a way that uh, the cancer could come yeah, back stronger. Sure. So, yeah. the, uh... but that's, that to me, those are, you know, uh, we can look at those and say, oh, well, that's just, uh, you know, that's just probability or whatever is all you're doing there. But I, I think if you listen to experienced doctors, they will describe treatment of that kind as almost a more artistic procedure. You know, it's, it, it can't really be run off spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. There is more of a sense and a feel to it that, ex that exists beyond our, our numbers and our, our actuarial tables and these kind of things that 
that is there too. And that, that to me is a spiritual uh, question, a spiritual task. Let me, um, let me, let me, let me outgrow this a little or, or grow yeah. this out a little bit then. Um, so, so let's take, um, let's take spiritual truth. Cause I think this will illustrate what you're talking about in terms of spiritual being a fundamental and it is an outgrowth from that. Um, so let's take, let's take some, and, and we can debate about it, but let's take the spiritual edict as being, um, it is good to help the unwell, something, mm-hmm. something of that effect. Mm-hmm. And I guess then what happens in the outgrowth portion is what do you mean by help? Yeah, and that's where yeah, that's, the, that's where the spiritual question comes along, because you're saying, well, in this context, where we're functionally able to do this help, suddenly we're switching to the spiritual realm is to do X or to do Y. Um, and, and that's factoring in more the person's well-being and what the person wants out of life and what's going to be best for that person in life at the moment. Um, whereas the functional question might be saying to the doctor is how do we kill the cancer? Well, they can give that functional truth, but then you have to step back and say, but is, is the cost benefit analysis almost worth it for that particular right. context? And it right. becomes a spiritual question. Yes. Yeah. I think that's, that's the right way, I guess, to, to frame all that. Yeah. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. And then from that, from that sort of, I, I don't want to say, well, axiom, you use the word axiom. I guess yeah. you could say from that axiom, we have the outgrowth of all of these various situations where we have to figure out application of those axioms. I guess. Yes. Yes. And, and okay. in a way, in a way that is consistent with that axiom. And that's what I mean by uh, the spiritual being the least fluid is that axiom doesn't change. Doesn't change. Yeah. 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 That, that idea of help the sick, it stays the same. Now what help means might be different based on circumstances, but that doesn't change, you know, just yeah. the treatments, the functional approaches we might take that changes over time. Certainly our material understanding changes even more More because the functional is then built off those material understandings so those things all change but that that central root that spiritual question of help help the poor or i mean help the sick and the poor uh that doesn't change yeah yeah i think it's i think and i just want to put one last thing in there to to put all these together it's very easy um and i have this tendency to be very rough on the material truth um, because maybe in response to materialism or in response to what the outgrowth of that can become, which we might talk about, but each is independent or each is valid, not independently, but within its context, they all still have the word truth after them. And so yes. it's, it's important to not denounce it as being untrue. It just needs to function within the place that it's supposed to. Yes, that's the key. And uh, yeah, I mean, it is, it's tough, because we live in a society that I think, uh, the key, as you said, within its role. And I think we live in a society that, frankly, um, it, it should be spiritual is the most important, again, the most uh, uh, solid, uh, the most consistent axiomatic of, of these truths. Yeah, I think uh, informed is a good word to connect there too. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah, it is, it is important, because it, 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 it tells you how to interact with the other truth yes yes um and so you know it's important to derive the spiritual meaning from the spiritual truths if you will um just as it's important to derive the functional approach from the functional truths yeah and it's important to derive the material uh, uh explanation from the material truths yeah however i think we live in a society where the the spiritual is the least verifiable, right? Yeah. Yeah. The functional is actually, it's somewhat verifiable, but also a little bit difficult to verify at times too. It's a little to, bit. To say that something works because I did this requires a great deal of, of yes. evidence and almost more evidence to say that this is a thing that exists. Yeah. And, and we can't ever have full proof either because there's always um, potential for variance. Yeah. Well, there's, and there's also material that we don't yet understand, right. Mm-hmm. Going to the elements, you know, there's, we can say, well, this or that is true because of this. And then we discover something new at the material level that says, well, no, that's not then that functionally didn't work because of what you thought it did because the material is now different than what you believed it to be at that time so 
uh, that can change. So the material is in fact, probably the most verifiable of these truths. And um, in, a, in a modern society, at least a Western society, where I would say we've grown uncomfortable um, with not being able to verify things, mm -hmm. we've taken to making the material the most important because we can verify it. And so because we can verify it, we derive, we derive the functional and more importantly, the meaning, the spiritual truth from the thing that we can verify and that's that's you're operating in the inverted order there uh mm. that's not really how this is supposed to work and in fact it doesn't work you can't verify how you should use something based on the material truth of what it is yeah so we're you using know? material to inform the functional and then to inform the spiritual yes yes yeah. i think we have a, a tendency to do that you know yeah. um and that is, um, that's a problem, I guess, let's yeah. say. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason we do that is because uh, where things are verifiable, it is easier for us to communicate with each other mm -hmm. um, and work across disparate beliefs and ideas. And this is sort of, this is one of the fundamental weaknesses of multiculturalism factoring in this is hey we don't we don't share the same culture but we have this stuff that we can verify and so therefore we can sort of talk across cultures this way um and so we have to sort of in order to have meaning within you know society of various cultures and and perspectives you have to build it out of the area where you can share a language uh, and that is what is quote unquote verifiable. Um, but we see that even that breaks down eventually because the truth is how do you define something that's verifiable? Well, it ends up working through the functional back to the spiritual, um, your beliefs on that, right? Uh, is reality real? Do you have some ability to perceive reality? Those are spiritual questions and what is, you know, the spiritual truth of that. And you get the postmodernists who say, uh, you know, more or less that truth is sort of created by you. Um, it's you, maybe there is some sort of, uh, you know, capital T truth out there, but you can't experience it. It's, it's your perceptions uh, create the reality in which you inhabit and these kind of things. So that is where we get a little bit backwards and the whole thing starts to crumble and fall apart. So relating to this particular endeavor here, uh, the realm of theology is concerned with that spiritual truth, that spiritual meaning. Um, not to say that the Bible doesn't have things to say about all three. Um, the Bible will see, eventually, hopefully we'll get there, uh, talks a lot about the idea of knowledge, of understanding, and of wisdom. And these actually relate to these three truths. Knowledge is material truth. When you have knowledge of something, you have uh, an un a, a grasp of the material truth of it. When you have understanding of something, you now see the functional truth in it. But most importantly, and what the Bible does, I think, spend the most of its time on is the wisdom, which then is the question of Okay, now what do you do with that? You know, what is the right way to handle those other two things? Uh, and and it, it will talk time again about the idea of knowledge and understanding without wisdom really is, is nothing. Um, and in fact, potentially dangerous to have knowledge and understanding without wisdom. And you need to seek wisdom first. Yeah. Um, you know, I think so the, that's, that's what that I think relates to specifically. I think much of the 20th century is a very good illustration of that. I think a lot of a lot of 20th century history is, is a very good illustration of 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 advancements in material um, in material understanding and then functional abilities, but that very quickly turns to to um, massive amounts of death and destruction. Um, yeah, there's and, chaos and born out of it. Exactly, and it's not guided by by wisdom that that right. would have, that would know how to deal with those things more properly. Um, I, yeah, if you, if you lack the map, you know, of wisdom and you can't navigate according to that wisdom, then you will be blown off course. 
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 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 Um, okay. So, and, and lastly, I want to relate this specifically to the Bible. Um, just a, and this is a personal thing. Other people have different approaches in this, you know, what I'm about to say. And I understand that to some people, this will be, uh, um, a little bit, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe it's heretical. We'll see. Uh, like we me, said, you're allowed to disagree with us. Yes. Uh, for me, I see Jesus as uh, in the Bible, undoubtedly the overlapping of all three of these truths, right? He is where the material meets the functional meets the spiritual. Uh, he is capital T truth, right? Uh, but the Bible as a whole, I think, is, is mostly about the spiritual truth. Um, and I, I do not see the Bible necessarily as a document expounding upon what exactly the functional truths are in the world mm -hmm. and what exactly the material truths are to an extent. I think it does get at those things and I think it, it lays those things out. But as we've been saying, those things tend to be more fluid, right? Yeah. So I think the way in which it talks about those things, the material truths and the functional truths, must necessarily be if you believe this to be the inspired word of god it must necessarily be to something that speaks to humans across time right it can't be bound by the the syntax and the the language and the um the way in which people have an understanding of the world around them in a particular time uh so in that sense it's to me is poetic in nature uh, so the best example I can give of this is Genesis 1. I think Genesis 1 uh, may, in fact, uh, have material truth to it. Now, I personally don't care whether it does, uh, because what matters to me is the spiritual truth that it has. And as long as I am taking the spiritual truth from it that I need to, then as we've said, the rest is derived from there. You can derive the functional learning you need to, you can derive the material learning you need to. Um, but I think, I, I think there actually is a lot of functional truth in it. And we'll get to that when we get to Genesis one, I think it's, it's uh, spiritual functionality, if you will. Um, it has to do with the function and role of God and sort of the spiritual way in which he set up the world. To run but as to the material truth of how the earth was created how it formed i think that may be there i don't know right uh it there is places in which you could take the scientific understanding of the material as it is right now and you could say that this is a poetic version of that science this is what uh dr hugh ross has done and I think his books are, are quite good and I think persuasive. And I think there's a part of me that would say, okay, maybe that is what's going on here. Um, but I'm not going to, I think, I think we're foolish when we put our flag in the sand and say, uh, you know, it, this is exactly what Genesis one is doing and describing the exact way in which creation happened materially. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, it may be contained within there, but it's certainly not the point of that chapter. And to the extent that we focus on that too much, uh, I think we discredit what is really important about Genesis 1, for instance. Well, you know, we, we've been talking for a little while about the, um, about the necessity of the spiritual informing the function informing the natural. It's very interesting that in, in, with a lot of modern churches, not all, but a lot, staking their, um, their flag, so to say, in Genesis 1, having a literal interpretation, they're right. starting off their Bible by saying the material must yes. inform our perspective on the world. Right which right. I think is very interesting because I think fundamentally the church should function primarily as a, as a place of spiritual truth. And so they should be staking their flags in the spiritual truth of Genesis 1-1 rather than staking it in the material truth. It's almost yeah. from the very beginning of their reading of the Bible, they're saying the material is more valuable than the spiritual, um, which... Yep 
which I think is is one of the reasons why we have a, a, a one of the many reasons why we potentially have this this growing distance between the normal population and the church, um, because the church is 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 falling into the same issue general society is by saying the material is more valuable than the spiritual. Um, whereas people should be able to look to the church and say that's a spiritual place and that's a place where I can pursue spiritual understanding. Um, yes. Yes. So and I think, I think that's uh, very interesting. Yeah, it, it creates conflict where it may not be necessary to create conflict. You know, we need to stand firm mm -hmm. on our ground on the things that really, really do um, matter. And the Bible does make very clear. Um, but sections like that, which are, are by their nature, you know, poetic. Um, and uh, as we get into that section, I think I'll show in a couple places the way that uh, there are verses there that you could argue are materially true today with your understanding, and you could argue are materially true uh, in the ancient uh, philosophers, uh, going to Aristotle's time, uh, in terms of the way they understood the formation of the earth. Uh, and then you could, you could go uh, even further with it in terms of saying, well, does ancient man believe this is exactly what happened, which may or may not be true. Um, mm -hmm. But that the very fact that it could be interpreted in a couple of different eras to say exactly how the world was formed yet uh, comport to the modern scientific understanding seems to indicate that it's, it's maybe it's saying uh, what really happened, but it's not saying exactly how it happened, if you will. Um, so it is, it is making clear, you know, God created the earth and maybe did it even in this order um and, but it's not it's not to be read quite so literally if you will uh you know poetry shouldn't be really um so yeah we'll get into i we'll get into more detail that when we get into genesis uh one but i i think the point that i want to make is as we go through this the thing that we're seeking most is the spiritual truth uh and then really going from there to the functional truth uh at at, at most i guess um because in a sense the spiritual truth really informs how you use the functional i think the material and i think there are points at which in the bible we could we could even argue that god uh makes this clear the material is almost uh, our duty to seek a better and better understanding of in order to bring it more in line with the spiritual and functional that the Bible might point us towards. So, uh, yeah, so that's uh, what we'll be doing. And uh, be sure to join us next episode. We're going to get into, uh, again, a little more of background on how we're thinking. And then, uh, you know, in a few weeks, we'll dive in uh, full steam ahead at a very slow pace uh, into Genesis 1. Carrying so, a big load. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. So, uh, like, subscribe, do all those things and, uh, we'll see you, uh, we'll see you soon.